so then for uh, inviting me here and introducing me to the audience i would like to begin this sharing of mine with a small prayer which i consider very important in my own life and it is from the upanishadic invocation purnam ada purnam idam purnat purnam udachayate purnasya purnam adaya purnam eva vasitade that is wholeness this is wholeness from wholeness comes wholeness if wholeness is taken from wholeness wholeness still remains let me also take this occasion to thank mr kulkarni and all his staff at this research center for organizing enlightening series of lectures so that uh, eventually what is hoped for is that the society is transformed and our mother india becomes still better place not only for us indians but for the whole world as it has always done for centuries dear friends i say these thoughts of mine with great love great love for myself being christian and great love for my brothers and sisters who follow the hindu path i believe that when we have achieved some kind of relationship of friendship with people we are able to then say almost with freedom what we feel like saying and i feel that with mr kulkarni i have reached that uh, stage and so knowing him i think i can say some things in front of the audience so that i am corrected if i am wrong and uh, something good may come out of it for the good of the whole world i begin by a short introduction as uh, the catholic church in 1962 from 1962 to 1965 uh, the highest level kind of meeting was held in the vatican in attendance were 4000 and some bishops of the catholic church who are leaders in the catholic church met in the vatican and since they met for the second time in 100 years it is called the second vatican council and in that a uh, very short document was passed approved and passed and promulgated as binding teaching on every catholic so i will just briefly give you what that document says about hinduism and then i move in to explain what hinduism is not pretending that you don't know it but how the catholic church kind of understands it and i take points that are perhaps relevant for us to see dialogue where we can constructively meet respect each other and see if we can do things together for humanity so the short but articulated document nostra etate that's the latin name declaration on the relationship of the church to non christian religions has brought about an important and significant change in the attitudes of christians 
towards other religious traditions and their respective followers. With the promulgation of Nostra Aetate, the Catholic Church officially proposed for the first time in history a positive, constructive and fraternal dialogue with the followers of other religions in the world. And I quote, In her task of fostering unity and love among men and even among nations, the Church gives primary consideration in this document to what human beings have in common and to what promotes fellowship among them. Unquote. The objective of this document, Nostra Aetate, are not to enter into polemic and create a debate between religions. Through dialogue, the Church wishes to enter into the very depth of the life of all people. The Church wishes to create a climate of cordiality and trust between Christians and followers of other religions so that all people may be able to dissipate mutual prejudice and ignorance and establish fruitful contact among them in order to collaborate on questions of common concern. So Nostra Aetate invites Catholics, first of all, to build bonds of friendship across religious boundaries. Hinduism is the first religion, religious tradition, which is mentioned by this document. This is what it states regarding the ancient religious tradition which is of course conveniently called Hinduism, a collective denomination for diverse socio-religious ethno-cultural groups known generically Sanatana Dharma by Hindus themselves. And I quote from this document with regard to Hinduism, this is what the document says to the Catholics, men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through unspent fruitfulness of myths and through searching philosophical inquiry. They seek release from the anguish of our condition through ascetical practices and deep meditation or a loving, trusting flight towards God. Unquote. A very brief kind of paragraph because it's a very, it's only three page document actually, which becomes the whole teaching for us. So it did not enter into, you know, it left on this basis much of the work for us to do the following generations. And much has happened, I must say. The declaration that document selects certain key elements of Hinduism without attempting the impossible task of describing in short space the complex nature of Hinduism. It is good to remember also that in its brief text on Hinduism, Nostra Aetate speaks exclusively of fundamental differences and does not directly mention any possible similarity Christianity could have with Hinduism. Moreover, the text refers principally, I would say, to classical Hinduism. Efforts towards understanding Hindus on the part of Christians, Catholics. It is important to approach every religion not as a monolithic block, but as a complex and diversified reality. It is necessary to take into account its historical, socio-cultural context as well as its actual existence lived by the people. This is true above all with regard to Hinduism, which, as is mentioned above, is a generic name and is used mostly by non-Hindus to describe many sampradayas, 
religious, socio, ethnico, cultural traditions of Indic origin. These sampradayas have evolved through centuries and each has its own specific identity. A question has been asked, who is really a Hindu? A distinct Hindu identity, I believe, can be found in a common inspiration and source, namely belief in the Veda, which contain eternal and infallible truths. The Veda are said to have no human author, a Pavrushiya. Thus, they are believed to be eternally revealed and heard, Shruti, by sages. In Karma Samsara, cycle of birth and rebirth and transmigration of life, observances of Varnashrama Dharma, caste system, and in Moksha or Mukti, that is definitive liberation. So these are common trends of Hinduism and therefore who is a Hindu we can easily identify according to me. <coughs> Hindus boastfully admit that their religious tradition has neither founder nor central authority nor common creed nor dogmatic teaching which has to be accepted by every Hindu. In the final an analysis as one of the most ancient texts in Hinduism states, which is very famous, Ekam Sad, Vipara Bahuda Vadanti, the absolute is unity, which is seen in diversity by sages, which is from the Rig Veda. There are no dogmatic affirmations, no, for example, concerning the nature of God in Hinduism. The ideal of life, that is definitive liberation, moksha, is never felt to depend on the existence or non-existence of God or whether there is one God or many. Developed during the span of approximately 4,000 years, Hinduism has gone through internal as well as external evolutions. The earliest period of Hinduism is marked by cosmotheanism, uh, sorry, cosmocentrism. At the center of the quest are fundamental questions about the origin, purpose and the ultimate goal of life. Natural forces are seen at work dynamically affecting human life and they are eventually identified as divinities of the outer world. An attempt is made to express the inexpressible mysteries of life the phenomenon which gives rise to innumerable myths in an attempt to relate to the outer world rituals are created. Then follows the second period in which the focus is theocentrism. Here the center of attention moves from the human beings to speculative ideas about the divinities of the outer world. Life is experienced as a network of relationships between human beings, natural forces and divinities. The quintessence of life is identified as ritual, that is yadnya, which is itself seen related to the great cosmic and primordial sacrifice. The society is thus ordered around the ritual in which concept of purity and impurity begin to dominate. Consequently, a social system emerges and those considered pure because of their function which is directly related to the ritual dominate the impure because of their function concerning the duties pertaining to ordinary life. In this period, different rituals for use on various occasions are defined, role of the celebrant determined and hymns to be sung at the elaborate rituals composed. As a counter movement to excessive ritualism, the attention again turns to the human beings. The third period therefore focuses on anthropocentrism. The evolving religious tradition 
reaches maturity in this period the core of hinduism moves from externals that is rituals to deep interiorization that is contemplation and going beyond external layers of the human person reflection centers on its essence atman in their search for the absolute the brahman which is experienced <clears throat> more and more in its unity profound mystical reflection is in progress during this period the absolute is spoken of with distinction as nirguna without attributes and saguna with attributes the nirguna is the higher or unmanifest aspect of reality and i quote here from isha upanishad all this whatever moves in this moving universe is permeated and inhabited by brahman enveloped by brahman nothing is prior to or beyond brahman as satpata brahmana would say brahman is neither this nor that it is only the ultimate the unlimited the quest for brahman can never be the quest for an object rather it is the quest for the origin of the questioner himself or herself it is not an object of vision speech thought or worship as told to us by kena upanishad the saguna aspect of the brahman is considered the lower or manifest aspect of the reality the one brahman is conceived and symbolized according to divine functions as brahma vishnu and shiva the trimurti within the great tradition of hinduism are four main living sub traditions or we can call them sampradayas shaivism vaishnavism shakta and smarta the differences among these are based upon conceptions and worship of the central name form symbols liturgies mythologies and theologies of the one god lord of the highest lord and the highest person as vishnu shiva shakti the divine mother smartas worship several personal manifestations of the supreme reality and philosophically emphasize the ultimate identity experience of the individual self with the supreme self which is also brahman however it is necessary to repeat that the absolute as such is not divided or separated it is seen as unity ekam eva advitiya one without a second as chandogya yuna upanishad would tell us according to colbrook a reputed author the real doctrine of the whole of the indian scriptures is the unity of the deity hindu theology as enunciated in the veda and even in the purana is thought to declare the unity of the godhead and therefore to be consistent with non is with monotheism the real hinduism has decidedly monotheistic leanings i purposely emphasize this because often dialogue with hindus can be discarded or put on a shelf because we think that hinduism is not a monotheistic religion in fact i must say that in vatican i always have vehemently represented to speak that you have to meet hindus who do not believe as we think in many gods but they believe in one ultimate mystery and the way to reach can be so many and therefore i just want to represent this especially when judaism christianity and islam are said to be monotheistic religions 
and i feel that is not correct and that is not respectful of the hindu tradition this is why i have emphasized this point here synthesis is achieved in the evolution of hinduism in the course of time as equilibrium is struck between the attention paid to the divine and to the human this could be called the fourth period in the evolution of hinduism it is in this period that the absolute is approached and worshiped as personal deity there is rich reflection in this period on the way the human person may achieve perfect union of atman with brahman and on the triple marga the way which consists of karma commitment to action jnana mystical knowledge and bhakti loving submission it is conceived that the divinity is present and pervasive in all that exists that is avatar without losing its pure essence it animates every person from within and leads everyone to achieve his her final moksha in the next period hinduism assumes popular religi- religiosity it is a period of the great epics like ramayan and mahabharat which bring out the hidden meaning of the veda by restating them for a wider audience that is smruti however philosophical reflection is not lacking in this period period moreover it is deep rich and fecund an elaborate speculative thought emerges through saddarshana six non dualistic or advaitic schools the indivisible absolute the personal god is spoken of as nominal that is satya and phenomenal that is nama roopa or according to its spiritual that is paramartha and practical vyavaharika implications hinduism produces in this period eminent scholars such as shankara ramanuja madhava nimbarka vallabha and others who interpret different hindu religious texts the present day hinduism is struggling for its self understanding shaken up by its encounter particularly with islam and then with christianity hindus have been trying to come to grips with the understanding of the ancient dharma in the actual post modern context an author of dutch origin steenbrink writes hinduism i quote here hinduism has experienced an inferiority complex during the last 750 years from 1200 to 1750 larger parts of india were dominated by muslim rulers while the legacy of the mogal emperors was taken over by the british for a period of two centuries hinduism experienced a long period of stagnation not only in the muslim period but also during the confrontation with western arrogance and superiority the westerners sometimes had short flirtations with a selection of ideas from india but more often considered hinduism as a non religion a vague unstructured and enigmatic pattern of fighting sects and conflicting doctrines a religion without proper dog- dogmatics or organization this is a quote from mr uh, dr steenbring confused between sentiments of self assertion on the one hand and temptation to seize political power on the other hand some hindus appear to be obsessed by hindutva ideology hindutva or hinduity or hinduness i don't know how to translate that into english is a word coined by vd vida savarkar who lived from 1883 to 1966 who discussed an idea of modern hindu nationalism during the british colonial period according to him the fundamental elements of hinduism are territory race and religion on the basis of this he propounded a theory that buddhists and sikhs 
could be considered Hindus but not Muslims or Christians. He contends by saying that Hindus were the original indigenous people in India and constituted one single nation, Rashtra. Hindus constitute not only a nation but also a race, Jati, with a common origin and blood. Savarkar defined Hindus as those who consider India their holy land, Punyabhumi, and the land of their ancestors, Matrubhumi or Pitrubhumi. One of the important distinctions made by Savarkar is between Hinduism and Hindutva, Hinduity and Hinduness. In his understanding, Hinduism refers only to religious beliefs and practices. It comprises only a small part of the totality of Hindutva, which refers to historical, racial, cultural factors constituting the Hindu nation. It is the unifying socio-cultural background of all Hindus. This I have taken from the book written by uh, V.D. Savarkar Hindutva, published in Pune in 1942. Some even speak of this present period as crisis in the evolution of Hinduism. Pratap Bhanu Mehta, and I quote what he writes, in fact, the crisis of Hindu Hinduism is signified by the fact that so much of contemporary Hindu identity is vested in this narrative, that is, narrative of victimhood. Hindutva for many who have internalized this narrative represents a coming to grips with history and assertion of the will to will of the will that finally put Hindu Hindus in charge of their own destiny in vulnerable in in, in invulnerable to take over a corro or corrosion by uh, outside forces Mehta further writes increasingly being a Hindu increasingly being a Hindu is coming to be identified with participation in the creation of a communal identity that can now fully and often furiously discharge its role in history. It is an identity constituted by a sense of injury, a sense of always having been on the losing side, a sense of innocent victimhood. Much of the understanding of history that sustains this sense of injury is simplified, a simplistic if not false. But of greater import is the fact that Hindu identity in so many ways is coming to rest upon a sense of resentment. It can, no longer it can no longer define itself by its achievements, the vitality of its thought and its creativity of and, and the creativity of its aspirations. That I mentioned only to kind of see, trying to kind of, you know, come to grips with where are Hindus at the moment so that Christians are able to really constructively and uh, uh, friendly dialogue with them. Now I have uh, just a few words to say about what has been the motive for Christians to engage in dialogue with Hindus. A sense of spiritual, sacred and divine in general pervades life of any Hindu believer. This is a very striking thing for us. Hindus manifest curiosity to learn on their own terms from those who declare to have had experience, anubhava, of the divine. Hindu tradition speaks of God who is intimately close to persons through Ishta Devata, transcendent and absolute like Brahman. Deus absconditus, as Latin would say, or hidden whose divinity lies obscured by the distorting veils of mundane existence only to burst forth on occasion in all splendor and power, Ishwara. These days we can experience this and this is 
the festivals are uh, my joyful uh, experiences to move around you know with the with my hindu friends then also the personal friend whom they see in krishna of the bhagavad gita also then omniscient omnipotent eternal benevolent blissful imperishable self revelatory self illuminating greater than whatever is predicated of him neti neti without form nirvishesha and without limitation niropadita for some hindus especially the followers of saivism god is terrifying almost consuming vitality embodied in libidousness and destructive power and expressed through images of poison fire and death for others the followers of vaishnavism god is majestical and sweet who is constantly becoming incarnate to save his creatures from harm while absorbing into himself the animal hierophanies that is the manifestations of primitive religion vishnu also embodies the aryan fire sacrifice through which the energy pervading the universe is controlled the honest and uh, sincere search for the absolute on the part of the hindu can be a very good starting point for hindu christian dialogue many hindus seem to be ready to pay any price at any cost to achieve experience of union with the divine on the part of a number of hindus a desire to come closer to the divine mystery in whatever way the individual finds best is evident when they willingly undertake heroic practices of mortification and asceticism they are not only sages meaning rishis and renouncers meaning swamis but there are so many common and ordinary hindus who practice honestly self discipline in view of spiritual satisfaction these are motives for us christians the hindu sadhana the spiritual discipline is central is centered on the quest for the real i or the self the atman of every person it is a discovery by a, by the person of the inner self which often remains obscured by the external self by descending to the depths of one's inner self one lives authentic life because the true self in contrast to the illusory self which is elevated and glorified often by us humans is distinct from that which is identified with one's ego body color weight height shape name form etc i can quote so many upanishads for this but lack of time so i will just continue it is affirmed that the i of each person has no independent existence of its own it is entirely dependent on the i of the satyasya satyam the only real it is concluded that the i of each person when awakened and the absolute or the only real are but a single i the hindu tradition has in the course of time made available to its followers different methods and techniques to sustain them in contemplation meditation and prayer in order to awaken in them the real i a sense of integral spiritual life can be generally observed among practicing hindus this is something that we have to learn as christians a sense of integral spiritual life not the dichotomized spiritual life in other words there is no dichotomy between spiritual and social life or between religious and cultural life hindu tradition also teaches its followers to live a balance between active karma yoga karma marga 
intellectual nanomarga and emotional or bhakti marga aspects of life examples of this spirituality could be found in persons like mahatma gandhi or gurudev tagore what have been the efforts to promote hindu christian encounter i just would like to take stock of that one can speak of hindu christian dialogue pointing to the initiative coming sometimes from christians and sometimes from hindus it is also possible to speak of hindu christian encounter at an official or institutional level mainly from the christian side or at the individual level i don't want to go much into like say swami vivekananda who participated in chicago in uh, 1893 the world parliament of religions you know that would be like the initiative of the hindus because for the first time i don't think there was even on the agenda to speak about dialogue as such if everybody was going to have a monologue and go away it was swami vivekananda who pointed the attention that be beyond monologue there is a dialogue which should be the uh, practice of our day but i speak here uh, for the catholic side as early as 1966 the catholic church both on universal as well as local level has made efforts to develop the churches bilateral relationship with hinduism not so much by entering into formal dialogue with hindus but by trying to understand the hindu world through the exploration of its ideas through philosophy beliefs ways of worship etc an important study was published in the vatican already in 1966 by cardinal paolo marella president of the pontifical council for interreligious dialogue and the name of the study was for a dialogue with hinduism it is a collection of articles by christian scholars on, on hinduism the dharma boasts of being a religion without the limits of time and therefore has a tendency to look down upon religions such as christianity which are founded on historical events one can further speak of hindu christian encounter at a particular period in history as both religious traditions especially hinduism have undergone significant evolution efforts in hindu christian dialogue have been both direct and indirect organized systematic spontaneous haphazard or coincidental according to raymond panikar and i quote one can speak of four distinct phases in hindu christian dialogue namely one the period in which hindus were dominant power two the period in which christians had the power although they were not in the majority three the present phase in which dialogue is understood as pre- predominantly doctrinal and four on the threshold of the breakthrough in which both traditions are now challenged this is from uh, one of his uh, books many christians find their dialogues with Hin- dialogue with hinduism on doctrinal level very attractive but it must be kept in mind that there does not exist clearly defined epistemological status between what hindus believe and what the christian faith teaches this i quote from one of the documents uh, recent documents in 1996 from the vatican the dialogue of truth has thus becomes most difficult it is even a dangerous proposition moreover hindus tend to judge a religion especially christian faith by using the measure of practice that is the anubhav of the divine mystery and the moral virtues of its followers it is also necessary therefore to bear in mind that the new attitude of dialogue with hindus today should not replace the combative op- apologetic that was of the past by an apologetic of insufficiency an attempt is made mainly on the protestant christian side 
to dialogue with Hindus concerning the person and function of Christ in Hinduism. With the exception of Raimundo Panikar, who is a Catholic theologian, whose uh, book is uh, displaced, displayed outside, uh, The Unknown Christ of Hinduism, there have been Protestant efforts uh, for dialogue with Hindus. For example, a British theologian by name uh, Farakkar, who has written the book Crown of Hinduism, uh, by M. M. Thomas, who some time ago became governor uh, of uh, one of the states in India, I don't remember where, he wrote The Acknowledged Christ of Indian Renaissance and uh, the book by uh, also other two authors, I don't have their exact uh, information on them, but these are some of the Protestant authors that try to talk about Jesus Christ as point of meeting. Reflection on the mystery of Jesus Christ has played a significant role in Indian Renaissance movement. The beginning of the British rule in India in the second half of the 18th century created a process of socio-political, economic and cultural changes. These changes led to a deep transformation especially in the feudal Hindu society affecting its socio-cultural, religious and philosophical tradition. This phenomenon of transformation has been called Indian Renaissance or Hindu Renaissance which extends roughly from Raja Ramamohan Roy from 1772 to Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan up to 1975. The word Renaissance is used by me because Many saw in it an analogy between what took place in India in the 19th and 20th centuries and what had happened in Europe some hundred years earlier when various forces of changes broke down the medieval European world order and ushered in, the be ushered in this beginning of a new era of modernity. Without ignoring important obstacles to overcome in Hindu-Christian dialogue, Particularly with regard to the mystery of Jesus Christ, we must first affirm that this dialogue started more than a century and a half ago and it raises certain fundamental questions. For us Christians, for example, validity of a purely personal experience of Christ, like Mahatma Gandhi, would have uh, a lot of commentary about his experience of Jesus Christ. And there are so many Hindus, even till today, I don't disqualify this, but I'm just raising theological questions that come up for dialogue, you know, because what would be the validity of a purely personal experience of Christ? What about the, necess the necessary affinity with the more metaphysical doctrine of Chalcedon, that is, when the doctrine on Jesus Christ is formulated, which became official Christian doctrine? So which is why sometimes then Christians would disqualify somebody. You speak of Christ, but that is not real Christ because that doesn't really. And then the Hindu would say, but this is my experience. Like uh, Raja Ram, uh, this uh, Ramakrishna Paramahos. So uh, is it necessary? Uh, sorry, it is necessary, however, that the Christians take Hindu sensitivity seriously into account, this is what I am pleading, that Christians take Hindu sensitivity seriously into account, just as Hindus must understand the true nature of the person of Christ. The presentation of the proper identity of Christianity should be simple and approachable, without any overtones of superiority, namely open to the values of its surroundings so inclined to ritual, to mysticism, to prayer and to communion with the divine practiced by Hindus. By common conviction, the monastic life, which is common to both traditions, Hindu and Christian, deserves particular attention. And here if I had a monk here, and Raimundo was uh, very much sought after as advisor to many monasteries around the world, 
because there is lot of common points that one finds when we talk of hindu christian dialogue on the experience level and that is acknowledged form of a good dialogue over the years since the promulgation of that document i started with nostra aetate such questions as the following have been asked by christians in dialogue with hindus what does the church hear from them about church about herself the call to encounter hindus as launched by the second vatican council which is the official binding teaching for us has now moved from the joy of mutual encounter to a frank honest face to face and challenging but enriching discussion according to me it is sometimes observed that if some segments of the church are subject to the temptation of relativizing its fundamental identity as christians other segments in christians or the in the church including both clergy and laity are bound up in gross ignorance in exclusivism in polemics in having nothing in common with and even in aggressiveness with regard to hinduism this i deplore just a few points about the difficulties that are faced in hindu christian relations the resurg resurgence of revivalism of uh, a certain period of hinduism in order to reacquire as if in nostalgia the dominant power of the past through various new movements and groups is evident among some upper class hindus some of these movements are described as highly politically motivated planned and systematic attacks on christians and hate campaign i speak for christians i think equally there may be matter to talk about from the hindu side uh, against the church in the recent years by some extremists have created difficulties for hindu christian dialogue i experience it from my side because when people kind of read one side and when people are not balanced in evaluating then somebody like me is taken to be you are mad why do you go there you know this happens with dialogue with muslims this happens with dialogue with uh, with hindus i think you know we need to uh, look into this matter however the church both catholic and protestant and i speak here of the bodies that are there for example we bishops catholic bishops in india we have one voice through what we call the catholic bishops conference of india cbci and the protestants have a body the national council of christian churches ncci which you mention on world level the vatican and the world council of churches these two bodies in india have always affirmed their readiness to dialogue also with extremist groups so the official catholic church is convinced of dialogue and will never give up no matter what even if unpleasant incidents may take place which are sporadic many times we should always take recourse to dialogue this is the position of the official uh, catholic church and also the official main line protestant church is the main line it must be admitted that some christian extremists often provoke tension among hindus by their aggressive preaching distribution of anti hindu literature and by making unkind remarks about hinduism in general in hindu christian dialogue in particular there is a tendency to dwell on apparent anal analogies the result of which is often false irenicism we cannot forget that dialogue between religions is not an exercise in superficial compromise the goal of a fruitful interreligious dialogue is not to search for the least common denominator in order to arrive at a common agreement at any cost it would be of no service to anyone if fundamental differences between the two traditions were ignored 
of course without allowing the differences to provoke tension and conflict as mr kulkarni said at the beginning every effort must be made to understand and acknowledge them in order to cultivate mutual respect and friendship one of the goals of hindu christian dialogue i believe for for us catholics is to study the main texts of hinduism in their historical development to study them so far as possible from inside and having so studied them to try to correlate them with aspects of catholic christianity which is which are of importance to them some distinctions might have to be made for instance there may be on one hand minor differences which can indeed be overcome if we examine them carefully and are ready to reformulate what we hold in a way in a way acceptable to the other there are on the other hand essential differences which perhaps can never be overcome but they should never become point of uh, uh, dispute or point of uh, conflict partners in hindu christian dialogue often uncritically dwell on the apparent common points without going deeper into the radical differences which both religious traditions imply not only does this hinder mutual enrichment and raise obstacles in respecting the otherness of the other but it also leads to leads people to engage in harmful actions which destroy the harmonious fabric of a peaceful society <coughs> a scholar a catholic scholar uh, zena r c zena robert uh, zena who was a uh, uh, spalding professor at uh, oxford university whom dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan succeeded zena who is another great uh, uh, scholar of uh, different religions his uh, book his translation and uh, comments on the bhagavad gita is a classical book in fact i have it here with me zena strongly criticizes his predecessor sarvapalli radhakrishnan now this is an intellectual kind of uh, uh, getting at professors and zena uh, this zena says this um he says that radhakrishnan posited his own form of vedantin monism the theory that reality is one and that all multiplicity is therefore to some extent illusory being no more than appearance as the ultimate truth and that all the religions were thus simply empirical paths leading towards the same truth zena continues such a position can of, of course be substantiated by carefully selected quotations from other religious systems and the philosophies allied to them but such support if you can call it support will then be apparent verbal and therefore fictitious for it leaves without uh, for it leaves wholly out of account the core and center of the non indian religions from the scriptures of which these quotations are violently wrenched this method i still find damnable this is zener still speaking to be rejected that is since in the long run it leads not to understanding harmony and friendship but to misunderstanding discord and a friendship which however sincere it may be it may appear to be is ultimately valueless because it is based on a fundamental misunderstanding it is based on a lie this is taken from concord and discord uh, these are oxford lectures that were given by uh, rc zena and are published in a big volume so i would like to continue by saying that differences need not be perceived as a threat that i am different in fact i asked for example mr kulkarni how should i we- uh, 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 vest myself what dress should i wear generally i do go 
with my uh, dress like this. But in a meeting like this, I thought of wearing also kurta pyjama that I generally wear. And he insisted, no, you must come with your bishop's dress. You know, Because I am dressed like this, I'm, I should not be threat to anybody. Because Swamiji is dressed this way, he should not be threat to anybody. So, differences when it comes to fundamental, I mean dress is something very minor I feel. But when it comes to fundamental differences, for example that the Christian faith teaches that the ultimate mystery of God is holy and fully manifested in the person of Jesus Christ. Now this is a fundamental difference because you will say yes and no. Yes, in the sense I accept to some extent. No, because he is not the unique. That mystery also is manifested in others, you will say. This would be fundamental difference for us. But that should not be perceived as a threat. In fact, differences are occasions for mutual enrichment, I feel. Far from being obstacles and hindrances, differences can also become occasions for engaging in deeper and more creative dialogue. In Hindu tradition, for instance, the symbol of food is of paramount importance, Annam Para Brahman. Food is our life, as it is taught in the Rigveda and also in the Taitriya Upanishad. Now, taking this symbol of food, coming to Christianity, especially to Catholic Christianity, Jesus publicly declared himself as the bread of life. I am the bread of life. I call it a Mahavakya of Jesus in the Gospel according to John. Now, since food is kind of emphasized in both the traditions, what happens is people immediately jump and conclude that both the religions are saying the same thing in the same way. I think doing that would harm our dialogue, but also I think we would impoverish ourselves as human beings. Both religious traditions, even though worship symbol of food as divine, like for us in the uh, mass, the Eucharist that the Christians have, the bread that is received in the form of a wafer generally, which is the symbol of bread, is no more bread for us, but it is Jesus' body itself. And we take it as Jesus' body. And if you ask me, but is it biological body? I don't know, but it is Jesus for me. You know, So, it is very important for us, same for Hindus about Annam. Yet, quite obviously, there is a radical difference between the Hindu affirmation of the Brahman as food and the Christian acceptance in faith of the unique revelation of God in Jesus. I could give another example, uh, that of, um, say, Avatara and the Christian mystery of Incarnation. The Bhagavad Gita introduces the concept of avatara by that famous verse, Yada Yada. And, uh, you know, for whenever the law of righteousness without, uh, withers away and lawlessness arises, then, I, then do I generate myself on earth for the protection of the good, for the destruction of evildoers, for the setting up of the, new, of the law of righteousness, I come into being after age after age, which is from the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. To this, I would also put there, again, St. John's Gospel, which introduces the mystery of the incarnation of Jesus, and I don't want to read the whole prologue in St. John's Gospel, how the word became flesh, you know, as it is said, Shabda that becomes Sharira. 
reading of the religious texts from the two traditions obviously draw attention to some points in common however avatar in hinduism and incarnation in christianity cannot mean the same thing and this is not to say which is better which is higher which is lower that is not the point but i think religions have fundamental differences and we must respect them so for the christian there is no god outside the one who is fully and finally revealed in jesus christ for example and it is different for hindus therefore this kind of putting together some texts that appear to be very similar would do harm to a good dialogue i feel hindu christian dialogue today appears to have stalled over a difference in understanding the issue of conversion which uh, mr kulkarni mentioned at the beginning which can mean both dharma parivartan or dharmantar this is these are two words we mention hindu tradition generally speaks of the entire life as a sadhana or conversion to god and i quote here from the bhagavad gita sense mind and soul they say are the places where desire lurks through these its mother's wisdom fooling the embodied self this is from chapter 3 of bhagavad gita so therefore the bhagavad gita recommends conversion that is a disciplinary process or disciplined process of integration through which atman returns to its natural state where birth and death are a sheer impossibility and which is the fixed state of brahman now in biblical language and that of the christian tradition conversion is the humble and penitent return of the heart to god in the desire to submit one's life more generously to god this is a quote from one of the documents of the vatican while dharma parivartan that is conversion has a more positive stance dharmantar the very word we can see it is taking distance from one religion to go to another religion dharmantar change from one religion to another is viewed negatively it is important to note that the two words are distinct but they are closely related at least from the christian point of view this is why the church accepts the possibility of change of religion the church believes that in obedience to one's own conscience a person is free to choose religion because it uh, it can be dharmantar can be part of the process of dhar- dharma parivartan in this process of conversion the decision may be made to leave one's previous spiritual or religious situation in order to direct oneself towards another sincere dialogue implies respect for the free decision of persons taken according to the dictates of their conscience this is why the church proposes the principle of religious freedom which constitutes the very heart of the human rights a distinction must be made must also be made between witness and proselytism these two words often are confused witness and proselytism while witness means simply and boldly living one's own religious life in an authentic consistent and uncompromising manner proselytism means an activity that intends to divide or draw members from another religious tradition by covert or overt methods of force so the church documents in the same vatican ii council which is a uh, teaching binding on the catholics makes this distinction very very clearly in fact canon law as the church has a canon law and the church is kind of regulated by that law 
very clearly says that anyone who forces in any way one's religion on others including christianity on others is to be condemned strongly that is not to be done and so this is the difference i just want to show that proselytism includes exploitation of the need or weakness or the lack of education of those to whom witness is offered witness is a more positive like i live my witness here for example it is particularly improper to make unjust and uncharitable reference to the beliefs and practices of others other religious communities this is again taken from uh, the world council of churches one of the articles you will find the website that i mention here and therefore i conclude uh, what are the prospectives for future of hindu christian dialogue i feel it is urgent that a formal exchange on academic level between universities with hindu and catholic identity in different parts of the world be introduced in fact i asked when i was asked to uh, i i said when i was asked to say to pope john paul the second and he promulgated this on the occasion of 375th anniversary of a very important catholic university in rome called urban university uh, this is what the pope said when i said that this what this is what is need this is what needs to be said and done in the catholic world so he said pope john paul the second looking towards the future my wish would be that the urban university which is the key catholic university in rome be distinguished among the roman universities for the special attention it shows to the cultures of the peoples and the great world religions starting with islam buddhism and hinduism and consequently would carefully examine the problem of interreligious dialogue with the with its uh, uh, with its theological christological and ecclesiastical implications this was a, a kind of a order that the pope gave followers of hinduism under its various forms comprise the third largest population in the religious world i guess over 800 million over the years efforts are being made to get it organized often with a hindutva ideology hinduism is thriving through many movements which are spread throughout the world and i have had the privilege of meeting many not only in india but in other parts of the world and which are well organized i say this to the catholics that with discernment we must have constructive dialogue in order that uh, the church really makes an appeal to dialogue with hindus as its priority and uh, uh, it becomes a credible credible proposition it is not just with lips and and words that one would say but seriously the church enters into a very serious dialogue with this third largest religious tradition in the world thank you very much